Oh, that, so, um, okay, I'm basically just an ordinary middle-aged journalist from southern England, and for some reason I seem to have devoted an absurdly high proportion of my free time over the past 20 years or so to the obscure northern sport of fell running. Um, fell, I should explain, is, is a northern English word for mountain, and so fell running is basically running up and down mountains. Um, and my mission over the next 20 minutes is basically to try and give you a sense of what running up and down mountains involves. Now, you may think this is something that you're never likely to want to do or try to do, but let's just keep an open mind on that for the <laughs> time being. Um, so what is fell running? Basically, it's a, it's a very British sport in various ways, um, not least the fact that it's basically only the British who do it. Um, I mean, there are, all sorts of there, are, there are all sorts of nations that have mountains and have ma practiced mountain running, but basically they're... They're people who have large mountains, much larger than ours, with large paths up. It tends to be much easier to run on in terms of, of surface. And so it's basically you know, athletics at altitude on very high slopes. In Britain, we have much smaller, scraggier mountains that spend most of their lives immersed in damp cloud and fog. Not a lot happens at the top. And so basically, there's not less call for um, proper paths and things like that. So if you happen to be racing someone from the, to the top of the mountain or, or racing someone to the bottom of the mountain, for that matter, the temptation to just take the shortest possible route is pretty much irresistible. Um, the trouble with that, of course, is that if you do start running in a straight line off a mountain, um, you're likely to start running on some pretty unsuitable terrain. I mean, not just you know, rough grass and mud and things like that, but also you know, pebbles, scree, bog, heather, um, great flat, wet boulders, things like that. I mean, you don't have to be a professor of sports physiology to realise that it's probably not a very sensible thing to do. But at the same time, it, it can be very good fun. And there are, there are corners of Britain where they do consider it the highest form of sport and, and not just in the sense of altitude. And, you know, the more I see of, of the world and of sport, the more I sort of tend to agree with them. Um, so... Roughly speaking, what's it involved? Most people assume that the hardest thing about running up and, mount up and down mountains is going up, which in fact is, turns out to be the easiest bit. I'm fine, you are, you're going, it's hard work, you're working against gravity, things like that, but um, you're not going very fast, and so the, the difficulty of the terrain is less of a problem. Um, sometimes you feel that your lungs are bursting and your calves are about to explode, but you sort of get used to that, and if you can just find the pace that's, that writes, that's right for you, then you can do it even at a pre low standard. It gets a bit trickier when you get to the top because um, by that point you're exhausted and drenched in sweat and everything like that and as with anything you do in the mountains, once you get to, onto the high ground then it can get a little bit more dangerous and um, you know, it, it's much colder um, you, you might well not be able to see where you're going because of the fog um, very, very windy um, it's all sorts of quite serious hazards that fell runners have to take seriously from you know, things relating to exposure to simply you know, falling off a cliff that you haven't seen and, and dying. So there's, there's that, there's that to, to worry about. But the, the real challenge and the thing that you know, fell runners devote most of their thought and concentration to is, is going downhill, which um, you know, the average runner might assume is something that's quite easy because you've got gravity working with you. But the trouble with going down a very steep hill is that it help, the gravity helps you a little bit too much and you just build up more and more momentum um, and either you basically have a choice you know every fell runner is faced with a, a dilemma as to how reckless they're prepared to be um, on the one hand you can try and keep yourself under control and that is very very hard work indeed as anyone who's even tried walking down a mountain will will know um, and if you're doing it on very unsuitable surfaces and loose rock and stuff like slippery stuff and things like that then the scope for injury is enormous. So there's a lot to be said for just, you know, the general tip for fell runners is when you turn up the top and come down, disengage the brain, you know, brakes off, brain off, and just, just go for it. But the trouble with that is you keep accelerating and getting faster and faster and faster, and at some point you do have to stop, um, and that can be quite difficult or, or painful. But, I mean, even, even a, a very moderate sort of, you know, I'm basically just a sort of middle of the range runner, even I going downhill on, on a mountain can I think quite comfortably reach Olympic spin, sprinting speed, which, it, which is quite fun um, <laughs> but also quite scary sometimes um, 
what else? I mean, fell running, it comes in many forms, fell running. It ranges from, you know, very short, straight up and down races that could be, you know, just a couple of miles, could be over in 15 minutes or less, and it can all be seen by people watching from the ground, to far, far longer things, you know, 50 miles or more over many, many mountains going on all day, or in, in some cases even longer, and including in various parts of Britain, certain sort of 24-hour challenges where you have to see how many peaks you can do or get a certain number of peaks done within, within 24 hours. Um, but I think what all these different sports of ty types of um, fell running have in common is that they all involve something more than just straightforward athletic ability. So you know, ath all athletes need speed and strength and stamina and things like that. But for running in the mountains, there's a whole extra, extra you know, you need agility, you need resilience, you need courage, a bit of recklessness. Sometimes you know, complete insanity can help a bit. Um, and all this, this aspect of it um, really sort of adds a whole extra dimension to the spool. Um, so, I mean, just to take one example, if there, there's a famous um, or relatively famous Cumbrian shepherd called Joss Naylor, who back in the 1970s set a couple of very famous 24-hour um, records and really, at the time, pushed back the frontiers of what was thought to be humanly possible um, in terms of, of running on, on the hills. But he was doing so amid some of the most atrocious storms in local memory um, and you know that to me that in involved a whole extra degree of heroism um, and I mean on that occasion one of those occasions Joss Nader was being accompanied by Chris Brasher who's the bloke who started the London Marathon um, and Brasher later wrote that you know what Joss Nader achieved that night was at least the equal of any of the Olympic triumphs he had seen in his life. And, you know, Chris Bracer actually, actually went to every Olympics for about th three decades and even won his own gold, gold medal, so he didn't know what he was talking about. Um, and so I, I think it gives you some sense of, of what, what the sport involves. I'm afraid I haven't got an audio-visual presentation, but I'm going to have to ask you to sort of use your imagination. So, I mean, I don't know if any of you have any recent experience of being in remote parts of rural Britain where it rains a lot or anything like that. Or, um, oh, if so, that's, that's great. Or if, you know, and everything's really muddy and things like that. But if you just sort of imagine that, ha the very worst weather you've experienced this weekend, say, but you're experiencing that at the top of the mountain. So it's, it's much, much colder, um, much, much wetter. It's at 45 degrees and everything's slippery. And you're exhausted. Um, in fact, for a 24-hour record, it could be the middle of the night as well, so you might not be able to see anything. Um, and you try to imagine the, the willpower involved to achieve real athletic ex excellence in that, those circumstances. And you can see that um, it's, it's really quite different if you then cut in your imagination to, say, you know, a state-of-the-art running track or a, you know, a road race with lots of drink stations and support vehicles and things like that. I and mean, they're so different as to be um, virtually two different sports. And personally, I, I'm, a, I'm a, always been a running fan, and I could bang on for hours about my heroes of conventional running, from sort of Zatopek and Nurmi up to you know, Mo Farah and Paula Radcliffe. Um, but the, the heroes of fell running, are, to me, are heroes squared because of that, that extra dimension. Um, but whereas in most sports, the people who achieve the absolute summits, it's a, you know, it's a fairly surefire route to fame and fortune. Um, no one ever got rich or famous from fell running. You know, it's, it's conceivable one or two of you may have heard of Joss Naylor, but I be, wouldn't be at all surprised if none of you have heard of some of the um, all-time greats of fell running from sort of Ernest Dalzell to Bill Teasdale to Kenny Stewart, Billy Bland, Helen Diamantides, Angela Mige. I presume that for most of you, these are, are names that mean nothing. Um, and yet, you know, objective comparisons have, have shown, both in terms of people who've crossed from one sport to the other and also in terms of physiological tests, that basically the, you're talking about athletes at pretty much the same sort of level. Um, but if, if you're an Olympic-grade Olympic superhero of fell running, you, you really have no prospect of earning anything from your sport apart from the respect of your, your peers and your rivals and your neighbours. And that's partly because fell running is virtually impossible to televise and so it's never become a, a, you know, a big money sport. But to, for me, that's what, what's one, an important part of why it is a, a very special sport and one that's perhaps unjustly neglected because it isn't really a sport that is about the heroism of other people. It does, it's not a sport where you're a fan and you... 
you watch what other people do and think how amazing it is. To get any real pleasure out, or you know, to get the most possible pleasure out of fell running, you have to try it yourself. And so it's really about the the heroism that you can can find within yourself if you, um, you know, if you give something a go. And at a time when you know, for most people, the word sport and that denotes a sort of lucrative and viciously competitive branch of the entertainment industry where um, you know, success can basically be bought and cheating is common in all sorts of ways and the win at all costs mentality is not just in, um, tolerated but actively encouraged. I think a you know, sport that has really stayed true to its roots as fell running has is um, something of enormous value and I don't know, if, you know how many of you are actual runners but of any kind but normally if you if you take up running in a sort of conventional sense, and it's very much a, a two-tier world. You know, the, the elite superheroes go in their special tournaments and their state-of-the-art tracks and so forth, and the rest of you, you know, are allowed to buy the same expensive state-of-the-art kit, but after that, it's, you know, put your ear headphones on and get on the pavement with everyone else and um, pound away with the crowds. And if you want to test yourself a bit, then you do the, you know, the, the same conventional routes everyone else you do your 5k and your 10k and your half marathon and your your marathon if you like um but you're in a completely separate world from the people who are doing it at the very highest level with fell running it's quite different it's basically the same experience for everyone um you know the superheroes do it a lot faster but you're still all up against the same mountain the same the same unique weather con conditions because one of the joys about fell running is that each time you do it it's different and the mountain is never the same twice um and so each time you're having a unique experience. Um, and, you know, we all change in the same car park and we all line up on the same starting line and we all wash in the same stream afterwards because, as I said, there isn't a lot of money in, in fell running. There aren't many facilities. Um, and we all drink in the pub afterwards and discuss the, the experiences we've had. Um, my, my particular... I mean, when I used to do a lot... When I was younger, I used to do a lot of fell running. The particular obsession that, that I had was a sort of... A minority sport within that minority sport. It was slightly more obscure. And it was trying to do one of the the, the most famous and oldest um, 24 hour challenge, a thing called the, the Bob Graham Round, which is basically a challenge in the Lake District that anyone can do um, any time. All you have to do is do a particular circuit of 42 peaks, which I, I think is about 70 miles if you take the right route, which you won't necessarily do. Um, and you had to complete it within 24 hours. Um, which is very, very difficult. It was first done by some, someone in a book called Bob Graham in 1932, and then for a long time afterwards, it was, it was actually considered to be impossible for anyone ever to, to repeat it. And back in the 1950s, when people were sort of getting, getting back into mountain adventure after the war, and people were trying to, preparing to the Everest expedition, and people were also trying to um, do the first four-minute mile, and the same group of people were also sort of overlapped with the group who were trying to get the first person to repeat the Bob Graham round and in fact the next person to do it I think it was about 1960 and then gradually another person did and another person did so by about 1971 I think they formed an elite club of about five people the Bob Graham 24 hour club who'd all managed to do the circuit and then gradually as with Everest and the four minute mile and other things that at some point in history we think are impossible um, it became possible somehow then it asked me exactly how for more and more people um, and you know, partly a question of equipment, partly a question of just knowledge filtering down and the people understanding, and partly a question of you know, psycho psychological barriers being broken. But I mean, I yeah, I think I'm with about the twelve hundredth person to do it, so it's, it's a much bigger group of people who have done it. But nonetheless, it is incredibly difficult, and it was particularly. Um, difficult for me, partly because I was a southerner and, and partly because I was, was manifestly unsuitable for it. I mean, they say the, the ideal fell runner sort of weighs about eight stone, has very good heart and lungs, um, probably been living in the mountains all their lives, so very, very sure footed on the mountains. Um, I'm, you know, I was a 13 stone southerner who spent the best years of his life smoking, had very weak ankles, and was terrified of heights. So, yeah, the. <laughs> were quite a few drawbacks, but somehow, as sometimes one does in sport, I, you know, I just got this objective and I just couldn't let it go. And I tried it once and failed, and I tried it again and failed, and I, I kept coming back. And you know, one time I'd fail because I got lost, and another time because I got injured, and another time I you know, just collapsed. And whatever it was, it, it wouldn't work. Eventually, after many years, I did finally get round it. And I haven't really got time here to talk about the 
full craziness of, of the obsession and, and what it cost me in, in terms of life and things like the time I could have spent doing other things instead. Um, but, you know, it was a very, very rewarding and um, educational experience. And I learned, I took a lot of things from it, including, you know, a sense of confidence that stayed with me that um, I, you know, ultimately, if you set your mind to a goal, you can achieve it, achieve it. And um, also a sense that, you know, sometimes you're doing something difficult and it goes on for a long time and there, there are troughs and highs and you have to get through the troughs and... Um, don't get overconfident in the highs and it all evens out in the end and perhaps most important of all just a sense of the importance of being totally honest with yourself and you know, I eventually concluded that although well, I've been trying really really hard for all these years to do it and thought that um, you know it's the thing I wanted more than anything else I perhaps didn't really really want it enough I wasn't quite being honest about whether I wanted to put myself through the pain that would be required if I was going to get the whole thing done and once I made that breakthrough and sort of achieved that honesty then I felt that's something I've taken with me as well. But, but I think perhaps that's, even that isn't the most important thing I've got out of fell running. I think the most important thing is simply learning, getting the opportunity to learn what, what sport and running can be like. If you sort of get outside the box of expectation of you know, the normal things you're supposed to do, and rather than just um, you know, meekly following the usual channels, just try something a bit different. I mean, when I tell people I, I run in the mountains for pleasure, they normally say, you must be mad. And I laugh and say, yes, yes, of course. And then I think, well, you know, these people who have, See nothing odd about you know running in a straight on a tre stationary treadmill for an hour, or you know running around in circles on a track, or you know breathing in loads of exhaust forms running on a pavement. I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's mad and mad. And although you know, fell runners love to moan about the negatives and the cold and the pain and the exhaustion and the injuries, but the, what keeps us coming back is the sheer joy of it. And the great thing about fell running is it's you know very very immersive experience. You once you set off for. On a, for a, a run, whether it's sort of 15 minutes or 15 hours, um, you really, really have to engage with the environment. You have to look at every detail of the, you know, the ground beneath your feet, every every nuance of the contours to check you're taking the right route. Um, you know, the, every clue about the broader landscape so you don't get lost. And you know, sometimes it's horrible, and the miseries of the mountains at their worst really, really hurt. But you know, at other times, the, the joys of the mountains at their best are simply indescribable. And you know, if you never really had that experience of, you know, running on frosty mountains by moonlight or running along a ridge and seeing the dawn breaking beneath you or, or just, you know, running through a storm and then suddenly the storm breaks and everything just sort of snaps into focus and it's just miraculous and I can't believe that other people, you know, that more people don't try it. Um, I think Thornton, Thornton Wilder said that the definition of an adventure is that when you're having it, at some point, you wish that you were safely back home. Um, <laughs> And I, think, and I think that's true. But in that sense, um, you know, every time I've been running in the fells, every single time has been an adventure at some point. Um, but you know, even, even the lowest points, the points when you're cold and lost and tired and bruised and you feel you can't go on, and the only thing that stops you lying down and stopping is the thought that you've got no other way of getting home and you do, you'll just die if you don't carry on. So you know, sometimes you do have to just force yourself to keep putting one foot on, in front of the other. And then much, much later, you suddenly realise that you've... Um, achieve something that you thought was impossible and that's you know an incredibly rewarding thing and and pat, pat even more than that though i think the greatest joy of all about fell running is simply the sense of the, the recklessness of it all the sense of being in touch with your environment and just breaking out of that shell of physical caution that i think you know encases most adult lives um and you know every now and then someone publishes a list of 50 things that every child should do before it grows up. And it normally includes sort of going camping and swimming in a stream and making things with sticks and that sort of stuff. And I was thinking, well, you know, why do children get all the fun? I mean, you know, adults should do stuff like that as well. Um, and, yeah, if I had a message today, it's simply, you know, you know, run outside the box a bit. I mean, you know, get muddy, fall over when you're sober. You know, do stuff by moonlight. I mean, it's... You know, you might not want to actually run up a mountain, but perhaps there are various ways in which you might perhaps just run outside the box a bit. <laughs>